Perfect. Now I have your number. Thanks. Hey, I'm Robbie Kramer. You're listening to the Leverage Podcast, where we discuss using your social skills to hack dating, travel, finding your dream job, and becoming a complete man. We all want to date the most beautiful women out there. Every guy I talk to says he wants a 10 or he wants a dime. Um, and a lot of guys say that, um, but they don't end up feeling like a 10 themselves or they don't understand what it, a 10 looks for or anything about who a 10 is. It's kind of like this nebulous sort of thought like, oh, I want this girl. I want this model. I want this stripper. Um, and for the longest time, I was just like everyone else. And that was kind of my mentality. And I thought one day I could hopefully just, you know, land a girl like that kind of out of serendipity or some stupid reason. Uh, and it wasn't until that I kind of got involved in the world of models and uh, nightclubs promoting um, that I realized that models and women of extreme beauty uh, or women that are somehow working in the sex industry, they just have a totally different life experience and mentality, things they look for than the usual girl that you might meet, you know, wherever at a bar or a club or, you know, the hot girl next door. It's just a different world. And you really don't get a feel for that unless you're in the industry. Um, and once you do understand the psychology of models, it totally opens the door because they stop going from these, you know, exotic, totally confusing creatures. And you realize that you can date women like this. They're extremely attainable uh, if you understand their psychology. But 999 out of 1,000 guys don't understand their psychology. They never will because it can be a pretty complicated subject. Um, so I'm really thankful I got to go through that journey. And it's very rare that I come across an individual that also understands the psychology. Um, and today we have a really cool guest on, Coach Bob Johnson, who actually used to work for Playboy magazine and has spent many years in the manosphere and understands this stuff, not just on a personal level, but when it comes to coaching um, and kind of working in the industry. He's a journalist by trade. He started working early on his career in some girly magazines, and then he worked for Vivid Entertainment for a few years, which is as you guys may know, a large uh, porn production company. Um, one of the most, I remember it as the most high-end porn production company when I was, you know, younger and watching a ton of those content. I always remember Vivid as like the, the best videos. Um, and he's the only person to ever be recruited from Vivid or from sort of the porn industry into Playboy, which is obviously Playboy has a reputation to uphold. So that's pretty cool. And um you know, it was his dream to work for Playboy, and he ended up accomplishing that. He also wrote a book that I recently read. It's called Never Out of Your League, and it is the most concise and I think best book out there for understanding the psychology of models. And if, and if you want to date those women and you don't understand the psychology, you have absolutely no chance. But if you do understand it, like I mentioned, it can be a lot easier than you may think. So Coach Bob Johnson, welcome to the show. And uh I'm excited to to pick your brain on this stuff. Hey, Robbie, th thanks, man, and thank you for having me. You know, as a I'm a, a big fan of what you do. I think you know your your program is one of the top in the industry, and um, you and I are kind of simpatico in that way. You know, we give guys advice with kind of a no bullshit, straight up kind of this this is the way it is. This is who, who you're going to date if you want to, and this is who you're not going to date if you can't. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's important. Uh, you know, this is one, one of those, this area, if you don't get, you know, harsh, exact feedback, you're never going to improve. So, um, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So tell us your story. Well, well, the first thing is, that, you know, take a look at me. If I can date these hotties, any one of you guys can. <laughs> <laughs> and no matter what, what you look like, what your age is, anything like that, we, we all have a shot in this. As you said, Robbie, it's basically a matter of, of mental acuity you yes. know really and the biggest thing is to 
how if we go through this whole procedure and you wind up with one thing to take away from all of this, it's how to inure yourself, inure, it's one of my favorite words, how to inure yourself from beauty. Because it's, it's the beauty of the girl that stops us in our tracks. You know, we, we are visual creatures. We are the guys, we are guys and all our hormones get involved with chicks and it's tits and ass, tits and ass, tits and ass. I mean, honestly, how many guys that you meet say, oh, where did you meet that, that girl? How come, you know, you're hooking up with her? Oh, because uh, she's a finance expert. No fucking why. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's because she's hot. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, but the flip side, you know, the girls, they, they have like de- detective agencies, you know, they will vet us every which way. You know, totally. does he like dogs? Does he like music that I like? Is, you know, is he, is he this? Is he that? Is he kind? What will he do? How will he be in bed? And all of this shit goes on in their heads. And we're just thinking, tits, ass, tits, ass, pretty, you know? Right. So there's that whole thing going on. So that's just a little precursor of, uh, you know, what, what we could talk about. But, yeah, my, my story is kind of, kind of interesting over the years. You know, I, I've taken the blows. Of, uh, I've had some successes and I've had some failures too. Um, but where it all started, I have to say, is probably when I was seven or eight years old, actually. Um, my, my parents were pretty liberal. And as a little kid, you know, I had curiosity, like we all do, you know, when we're young guys, we start jerking off and stuff. And I was kind of interested. And I had access to Playboy magazines. This was uh, in the 60s. Yeah. So I, I, you know, as a young kid, I'd be looking at Playboy magazine and my parents were cool about it. You know, they'd say, okay, you know, he's a regular red blooded American boy. He likes girls. Cool. So that's but, funny you say that because my grandpa used to have Playboy magazines around and this was in the, you know, I was probably eight, nine, 10 years old in the early 90s. And uh, I would go visit him down in Florida and always find a stash of Playboys. And, you know, my friends would be like, oh, my God, you saw a Playboy? How did you do that? So it's, it's interesting getting access to that as a, as a young kid. I mean, now in the Internet age, uh, who knows oh, yeah. what the hell these guys are looking at. But back yeah, then, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I can imagine in the 60s that that would have had to be you know, much more significant than when I saw it, of course. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. and, you know, and it set the stage because I gravitated towards that. You know, it was like on one hand, I was reading Superman comics. <laughs> right. saying, oh, boy, that's cool. And on the other hand, I was looking at Hefner's lifestyle and saying, well, that's even cooler. And plus it's got girls, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. so that, that's even a lot better. So uh, funny story, when um, in the back of the older Playboys, they used to sell Playboy rabbit head cufflinks. And they have little ads in the back of the magazine. So I always wanted these things. I, I coveted the Playboy cufflink because I said, oh, man, that, that's just a signifier of such a cool lifestyle, you know, as I flipped through the mat. So I went to my mom one day and said, Mom, would you get me these, these cufflinks? She said, well, cufflinks? She goes, well, you're a kid. You don't even have a... <laughs> You don't have a suit. <laughs> French, yeah, you don't have a suit. You don't have a French cuff sh- shirt. What are you going to do with cufflinks? And, you know, at eight years old, man, I said, well, you know, Hugh Hefner works in his pajamas. I have pajamas. I can have the cufflinks. <laughs> so uh, I did not get the cufflinks, but <laughs> it, it just stuck in my head, you know, eight years old saying, well, why can't I do that? Why can't I have that world? So that kind of was mm-hmm. on my radar. From when I was a little kid, um, it, it got me interested in journalism, and ultimately I became a journalist and wrote for some some newspapers and some magazines, uh, straight magazines and things like that. You know, computer magazines and uh, regular local newspapers. I was writing uh, advertising copies. So being a journalist was in always in the back of my mind. You know, I, I'm a big believer in. Uh, in the subconscious and how the subconscious affects you throughout your life. And when you, you create this certain paradigm in your head, that, mm-hmm. that goal is what pushes you through life. You know, and you may not be realize it initially, but that's what you want to do with yourself. Mm-hmm. And that's important for guys, you know, as you know, you know, when you, when you're coaching guys in, in their own, their own deal and their self-empowerment and to, to be mentally fit, 
that way is so, so strong. And it, it's yeah. all about your mind. It's all about your mind. Totally. Just like with beautiful women, you know, it, it's guys think, I mean, the, the way I used to think was, you know, I'm kind of at the time when I was kind of getting, getting into all the dating coaching PUA stuff, I was like, well, you know, I'm like a six. Uh, so I deserve a six, that sort of thing. But, you know, and I, in my mind, I was like, well, it's just, you know, beautiful women date beautiful guys. And that's yeah. the furthest thing from reality. That's so. such a great point that it, mm. that's that self-limiting belief, because as men, we equate our looks with their looks. Right. And it, it's, it's a disconnect. We conflate that idea that because she's beautiful, thus she must want a beautiful guy. And right. that's so not the case. Like I said, you know, their detective agency is all different than <laughs> ours. You know, we just have all those hormones zeroed in. Right. Anyway, um, so to, as I was as a journalist, I was kind of got bored with all that, you know, been there, done that. And I said, look, what I really want to do is I want to get involved in a situation where I can meet some, you know, gorgeous girls. You know, I want to be in that world of models and urbane playboy world. I want to be in that world, whether I work for playboy or not, I want to be in that, that, that place. And being in New York City helped a lot. Uh, at the time. So I wound up working for High Society magazine, uh, which was a girly magazine, and which had Cherie and a number of others, including Playgirl, by the way, which is a, a woman's magazine, but it's really a gay magazine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was, it always was, and always will be. Right. Uh, but all of these, these magazines were in, in the publishing house I was working for. Um, and that's when I really got exposed to, no pun intended, to the, to the world of, uh, of hot girls, models, porn stars, and the whole deal. And, you know, we would do shoots, we would be on movie shoots, we would go to strip clubs. So I got a real sense of how girls who were completely idolized and pedestalized by men think, you know, what, what goes on in their heads, you know? even though those, those, for the most part, were sex workers, mm -hmm. um, they had a different mindset. And in, one, in some ways, but in other ways, they, they're just regular girls. So but mm -hmm. we'll get to that later. Um, eventually, we, we got involved in the internet and we blew up the internet. We were making, really like in the early 90s, when no one was touching it, we were blowing it up with our, our websites. Um, so Vivid um, realized that we were doing so well on the websites and they weren't, surprisingly enough. I got a call because I, I was friendly with them for being in the industry to, to come on and, and honcho their web operation, which I did. You know, when I first went there, they had one site. It was called Vivid.com. Mm -hmm. I said, dudes, you've got 10 Vivid girls. And like you said, remember those, those were the top, the cream of the crop at the time. Mm -hmm. I said, you have 11 sites here. He said, every one of these girls is her own site that could mm -hmm. feed off of the other sites. And you got a gigantic marketing program. Your funnel is, is sick. So we did that, did real well with that. And um, just at that time, Playboy was in a, in a big transition. It was run by Christy Hefner, who was uh, Hugh Hefner's daughter. Mm -hmm. And they really didn't know what they were doing. They completely dropped the ball on the internet. I mean, Playboy could have owned the internet when it first hit. But you yeah. know, you were getting all these young dudes out there who were just creating sites left and right. And they were, they were eating Playboy's lunch, you know, mm -hmm. all kinds of porn stuff. And they were making money like crazy. And Playboy was just, we don't know what to do. You know, because Playboy never wanted to, to go, go harder. You know, right in in the in the seventies they had a thing with with penthouse magazine which they called the pubic wars at the time. Well, Bob Guccione was the first you know American publisher to really show pubic hair, and Playboy w was very resistant to it. Finally, they did, mm -hmm. but that kind of carried over for years and years, and they never wanted to cross that line because Playboy considers itself an entertainment company and not an adult company. Right. So um, they gave me a call and they had, they had some new management there. And they said, well, we wanna, we wanna take 
our spice brand, which was part of Playboy that people didn't even realize it was their the nighttime cable stuff, mm -hmm. spice, spice productions. And we want to make that, you know, kind of the cash cow to fuel Playboy. And then we want to add some more Playboy stuff into, into uh, more heart, heart of Playboy stuff into the mix. So we want to transition and do all that. So that, that's where I came in. Mm -hmm. and I kind of coordinated that. I, I shot movies under the Spice labels. And uh, we started slowly but surely integrating more Playboy stuff and the crossover. And there was a, just a bunch of stuff going on. There. That was a blast. But the difference was where I was getting probably, you know, B, B plus level girls on, in the adult business. You're getting, I was getting A and A plus <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, going through the Playboy doors. And not only just in the area that I was working in, but down the hall from me in my LA office was the casting director for Playboy, who casted all of their, the Playmates, the Bunnies, the, not the Bunnies so much, but the Playmates, the Bunnies who became Playmates, but all of the visual uh, assets that we had and the girls who would be part of that would be coming past my door almost every day. Mm -hmm. it, it was it was ridiculous, you know. I couldn't stand up most of the time for obvious. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and then as we we were shooting and getting involved and talking to these girls, you know, I was and also another part of this was the mansion. You know, I'd, ha I'd have access to the Playboy Mansion every now and then. We'd be over there and we'd be talking to the Playmates. And oh, good deal. Yeah. <laughs> Every guy's dream to go to the mansion. Yeah, yeah. Funny story about that, too. Um, I, I had drive-on privileges being an exec there, which you really don't get. When people go to the man a mansion party, you got to get in a bus down in, on, on the lower hills, and the bus will take you up. But I had drive-on privileges, which was very cool. Um. I was going to um, an event one night in, at the mansion and my niece uh, wanted to come along with me. She, was, she had a desire to be, to go to the Playboy Mansion. I mm -hmm. said, okay, fine. Well, um, she, she likes girls, my niece. So okay. How we, old is she? Was she at the time? Um, she's about 25. 26. Okay. Yeah. So we, we drive up to the mansion <laughs> and, Robbie, no sooner did I close the door and turn around, said hello to a few pa people. She's out in the grotto naked with some other chick. <laughs> she must have thought she had a pretty cool uncle. Yeah, yeah, she, she does. <laughs> so all of 10 minutes, you know, right. the, the whole hedonistic world exploded to her. Oh, right. Boom. It was all oh, right, man. Okay, <laughs> knock yourself out. <laughs> so, that was not fun. Um, yeah, that's something interesting I've seen too in, in my experience where, you know, you, you think some girls are either shy or vanilla or, or sort of like, oh, that's not going to be their interest. And then you put them in an environment that's highly sexualized where everything's okay and they love it. They, they totally like, were like, wow, I didn't know she had that in her. It's like, oh, she, she just needed that environment to realize that she it was okay and she's comfortable doing that uh so that was something that was shocking to me as i you know kind of went on my journey you know you can never really you can never really uh judge a book by its cover right absolutely and you know that's what i tell my clients too because especially when they get into a sexual situation if they get to that point with a really hot girl you know they start to get intimidated because mm -hmm. they think you know oh these girls must have been with the biggest studs and you know the greatest lovers in the world but they have it most yeah. of, a lot of them because guys are just afraid to approach them and and then when they do get a guy who really knows what he's doing or, or just lets himself go you you find out that they're dirty girls you know mm -hmm. they are as dirty as any girl you know and they like it even better because Normally, they'd have to, to put up a front, you know, if they're thinking, well, I'm, I don't want to get with this guy, but, you know, I'm, I'm real nervous about it. it could, because they're so attuned to, to their beauty. Because a hot girl's beauty is her currency. So, so when they're in bed with a guy who makes them comfortable, they're not worried about, is my hair right? You know, did I shave my legs right? 
do I smell right? You know, is my makeup mess? They don't care that much when they when they get comfortable with a guy, and that's when that's what guys don't get that they're just regular girls with all the window dressing off. You know, right? So it, it, it and they're they're so focused on the girl's beauty and they're uncomfortable because of the beauty that the girl never feels comfortable most of the time. And uh, yeah, that's for, for the longest time. That's why I kept striking out with them because I would, you know, do things to get them interested, but I had them on such a pedestal because of their beauty and thinking all those things about, Oh my God, she expects this or that. And it was only until I was like, you know what, who cares how hot she is? Like that's, you know, what made the difference. That's the key. Yeah. Right. And- now, I'm also a certified sex coach, mm-hmm. so I kind of dug into that world, too. I have a doctorate in human sexuality, so I got involved in that and figured out, you know, their their libidos, their psyche is often restrained because they're always on the lookout for the other girl. You know, it's, oh, that girl is prettier than me. Well, mm. That girl's hotter than, than me. I got to be better. I got to be hotter. I got to look like a uh, Kardashian. You know, I got to do this. I got to do that. And, and they actually get repressed psychologically. So the guy who could open that up and let, let that, that banshee out, man, they're, mm-hmm. they're going to find some real dirty girls who are really hot. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so what was, um, when you were going through, you know, during your career, um, you know, as you were, you know, starting with Playboy or went in these other companies that you were around, around beautiful women, um, sex workers, models, blah, 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 all the time. What was, you know, how was your uh, confidence with them? Um, were you more of a natural or someone that, you know, struggled because you didn't understand the beauty or, you know, what, what was kind of your mindset as you were developing? Yeah, as a young guy, you know, I was... I would always picture myself as a romantic, you know, I bought into all the rom-com stuff. Mm-hmm. It was, you know, I would be a natural charmer, you know, poetry, you know, be, you know, be attentive, um, do all that stuff. And in some ways that works. And I mean, it'd be interested in your take on this too, because there's always that, that dichotomy between, you know, guys say, well, I got to be really indifferent and then other guys say, well, no, you got to be more attentive. And it's like, well, what's the right path, you know? Mm-hmm. But answer to your question, yeah, as a young guy, you know, in my late teens, early 20s, I bought into all that. You know, I bought into this is how you're supposed to woo a girl. And, you know, girls are these amazing creatures that you don't have a shot with, you know. Uh, and, and, some, and I got dumped, man. I got dumped. I got my heart broken a few times. And. Oh, and like all guys, and we start to wonder, well, what do we do wrong? You know, we mm-hmm. start blaming ourselves, you know, mm-hmm. we must have done something wrong. When in fact, you may have not done anything wrong. It could have been a multitude of reasons that, that fucked up your situation. But that's mm-hmm. another story. Um, but yeah, uh, so it, it only changed when I started being around a lot of pretty girls a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. And here's a little thing. The more you're around beautiful women and the more you tell them what to do, <laughs> mm-hmm. job or, or, you know, in, in a, just anything, you know, and you, you're, you're doing a project or you're working in a soup kitchen, whatever, you're around pretty girls and you tell them what to do. They start to lose their allure. Not their allure, but they lose that frightening of appearance that, that you build in your head. Right. Realize, and they like that. They love it. Yeah. They like it. Most of the guys I know that landed a beautiful girl was simply because she worked under them. And that power oh. dynamic is what allowed that to actually work. And without that power dynamic, they would have never been able to, <laughs> to land that girl. Right. So mm-hmm. That's right. The polarity is so strong because pre- most people, pretty girls, beautiful girls, smoke show girls, they're very much in their feminine. Yeah. And, you know, unless a guy's in his masculine, which is pretty, pretty much the leader in most cases, and I don't mean an asshole leader, but, you know, a guy who says, well, we're, we're going to go here later on, let's be ready at eight, you know, that mm-hmm. kind of thing. 
that polarity works. You know, there's the attraction. You know, when you're just, oh yes, honey, oh yeah, yeah, whatever you like, where would you like to go? You know what? Mm-hmm. No. All of the, I mean, our culture is just completely bombards us into being like, you know, feminine, passive, nice guys. That's how I, you know, was was raised to to be a mensch. You know, the Jewish word for uh, a, yeah. a nice guy pussy, basically. <laughs> and um, yeah. I mean, obviously it doesn't mean that, but my mom would always be like, you should be a mensch and, and blah, 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 you know? And um, I would, I saw my, you know, the relationship between my mom and dad and it was basically like, yeah, mom makes the rules um, most of the time. And uh, I mean, they had a, they have a really good relationship, but the, the way I viewed it, was more like my dad was working most of the time, you know, he's, he's a doctor. And so I was spending way more time with my mom and she's a stereotypical Jewish mom. So I was basically, you know, with all the just kind of a, living a sheltered, you know, going to private school, all that shit, I just became a, you know, and getting bombarded with just the, the media and the culture, you just kind of, there's so many guys that grew up in my generation that are, you know, struggled with this stuff. Was it for you? Was it less of that? I'm guessing because that uh, kind of came after feminism and stuff, right? Um, yeah, I grew up in the first wave of feminism. Mm-hmm. So kind of got started getting the taste of that where, you know, men were, were supposed to, you know, it was the hippie generation. It was mm-hmm. be cool, just be laid back. And, you know, you know so it, there was too much equality and egalitarianism. There was too much of that. Yeah. It was too much, well, everybody's the same. Well, men and women are not the same. You know, we're absolutely different in so many ways. And don't get me wrong, you know, I don't blast a woman's equality by any stretch. I mean, I, they're they're superior to us in many many ways. Sure. You know, we're we're just you know dick and hand straight ahead, right? <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, but uh, what I was noticing though, as, as as time went on, was the more I would be able to be in a position like that, where you know girls would respond to me, I was saying, hmm, there's something here. Um, they like leadership you know mm-hmm. they like the idea that well they don't have to do anything but look pretty when they want to you know uh, but you know it, w- it was tough because it was a balancing act uh, for a while between what I was here and let's fast forward a little bit into the pickup world when I was working for the uh, Neil Strauss's group the style life people I was writing copy for them you know the, mm-hmm. that wrote, um, the game book which was like the bible of pick up yeah that's what got me into the the whole world yeah which is funny because he just reported on it yeah <laughs> yeah he's given all the credit for, right for making it what it was mm-hmm. um so then it became the whole other thing you know dropping eggs and you know telling girls you know that they're not that, that they're not to shit so they'll be more interested in you and that was working for me for, with girls who were about 19 years old. Mm-hmm. <laughs> any girl who had any more going on, and they, they dropped that after a while and stopped being an asshole. Mm-hmm. So there's always this balancing act between being aloof, a little aloof, a little indifferent, and yet attentive, and still being a gentleman. Right. It, man, we got it tough. Yeah. You know? That's why I think the coaching world is so strong and why, you know, good coaches like you and, and others are so valuable to guys. You know, they just need that, that extra push. And especially nowadays, you know, with yeah, the for- movement and second wave feminism and all of that stuff, man. That's- it's such a confusing sort of uh, experience for guys. And I was so confused because, my instincts when it came to beautiful women, and I think most guys' instincts that were were totally off. You yeah. know, the, the more beautiful a woman was, the more I would be afraid of her, the more I would attempt to cater to her and tell her what she wanted to hear. Um, the nicer I'd be, the more favors I would do. And it was all simply because I was trying to get in her pants, of course, right? And I was like, okay, well 
if if I'm nice to her and I bring extra copies of my homework and <laughs> you know kiss her ass, then eventually she'll see what a good guy I am. You know, like my mom told me, a nice little mensch, <laughs> and uh, and then I'll get that girl. And it wasn't until uh, I, I my buddy who was just I met this guy who was just a total. I mean, he was kind of a narcissist, but he was with women. Um, you know, he just didn't care. He he would treat them the same as he would treat, you know, any like like a an underling or a busboy at a restaurant. You know, he would and he was he was straight up mean to them and criticizing of them, but only when they deserved it. Mm-hmm. And I and I couldn't believe like I would see him, you know, chewing a girl's head off for something stupid she did, and I would watch her go from like angry to attracted and turned on to like completely submissive to him. And I'm like, wow, I'm not doing any of that. And I had, and there's so many opportunities to do that because beautiful women can be outrageously, you know, ridiculous. And a lot of the time they're like, I'm hot. I can do whatever I want. Everyone's going to, you know, suck my dick for lack of a better word. (laughs) Right. And it wasn't until I witnessed him basically calling them out on their shit when they deserved it and not putting them on a pedestal and not giving a fuck how hot they were that I was, I kind of started to click in my mind, like, Oh, okay. That's totally opposite of what I'm doing. Yeah. Because yeah, like, you know, you said at the top of the show, um, there's a certain psychology with these girls and the psychology, you think about it when a girl is, is pretty, even as a little kid, she's just given everything she wants. Yeah. Oh, look at how how cute she is. Give her this. Oh, look at how nice. And then she gets into school and, oh, she's the cutest girl in the class. Then she gets into high school. She becomes one of the mean girls, right? And cheerleaders. And they get all the guys. They get all the best guys. So all of her childhood up to her 20s, adolescence, they're adored. And here's a key. like They rarely get rejected for anything. Yeah. You know? So they don't have empathy. Right. They don't know what it is to be rejected. So they'll reject guys like, boom, boom, boom. You're gone, you're gone, you're gone. And not, not think twice because they don't know how it feels. Yeah, that's so important because yeah. once you get rejected, you know how it feels. Yeah. You know, you're really careful not to make other people, because it's the worst, you know, it's a horrible feeling. And- um, Sociopath, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you've never experienced that, they're just like, bye-bye, get away. And, Cause they don't know. And, and it's so true. Like, it's so hard for, for us to imagine because, I mean, I was, you know, brutally rejected in like seventh grade and then a million times after that. But imagine growing up to be like 20 years old and you've never been rejected ever. And everything you say, even if it's fucking retarded, every dude is like, wow, you're so smart. You're so amazing just because I want to fuck you. And it's like <laughs> you grow up with this ridiculous sense of self that's totally, you know, baseless from reality just because of your beauty so it's it's so strange and then then you add like we said before you know especially with the millennial generation you add all this other stuff girl power and second wave feminism and the cinderella syndrome where you know they have to have prince charming or nobody else and you know the bazillion guys orbiting them constantly i mean this this is so new when i was a young guy that, that did not exist you know, you hmm. met a girl at a party, you met a girl at something when you went away, you met a girl through friends, or you met a girl at a bar. That was it. Right. And that was it. There was no other ways. You know, the dating service was, that was ridiculous. Nobody did that. And I guess without digital communication, there's not really a way to orbit. Because, like, if you don't That's see them, right. you can call their house phone, but, you know, their mom's going to pick up. But it's not like you can... That's about it, right? Yeah, what, what, watch Happy Days. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's how people date, man. <laughs> if you weren't the Fonz, you were not even married. <laughs> so, yeah, so the, it, it, now it's so tough for guys. You know, I read an article in uh, Vanity Fair about a year or two ago about Tinder. And it's, it, they gave statistics about how a hot girl, when she, she posts her photos, will get something like 3,000 responses within 24 hours. When the av- when a, and a, and a good looking guy in contrast will get mm-hmm. 40. 40? 40. Wow. So look at the disparity there. 
and they have, they have a, a hundred times. Sorry, right? Yeah, no, yeah. They, yeah. <laughs> yeah they just have their pet man. Of if you do one thing wrong, you don't tick this box. Right? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Next. <laughs> yeah. Next. So so the key is you know for guys who want the hot chicks is to just be bulletproof to their beauty. Mm -hmm. You just build that wall, you know. I like to tell a story to some of my clients about, well, you know, how do how do you do that? How do you how do you build that confidence? I, I said, well, think about it this way. Say you you were going to another city for a very important job interview, and you're running late. And you've never been in the city before, and you get in the cab, and the cab leaves you off on a corner because he doesn't know the right address. It's screwed up and you're out there and you're five minutes from where you got to be. Okay. And you're walking down the street and some smoke show of a girl's walking towards you. It's the only one person that you could say, what are you going to do? You're going to walk up to him and say, uh, can you tell me where this address is? I'm late. I got, it. and you completely forget that she's a gorgeous girl. You're not mm -hmm. going to go around her because she's gorgeous because you need to get to where you're going to get. So right there, you're capable of talking to a beautiful girl like she's just anybody else because you need to know something badly at that time and you forget all of this smoke that's been built up in you about gorgeous girls are different. Gorgeous girls have beautiful boyfriends. Gorgeous girls can get whatever they want. Gorgeous girls don't fuck. Gorgeous girls don't. You just lose that. So that that's an important aspect you, know, you you build that confidence by approaching as many beautiful girls as possible yeah. and then they go well i can't i can't do that I, how do i start that well you just do it and you keep doing it and you keep doing you know for god's sakes what would you rather do approach an ugly girl or a beautiful girl yeah you know? <laughs> well a lot of guys well, they think, oh, well, I need to work up the confidence to approach the beautiful one. So let me start on a girl who's more in my league. And then eventually I'll be able to graduate to that. And my response to that is like, no, that's horrible because girls who aren't beautiful, they're not comfortable being hit on most of the time. And you're going to get way worse rejections from that girl than you're going to get from a beautiful girl who has rejected a ton of guys. And probably, you know, knows how to do it. She's not going to freak out. Like she, she might just give you the cold shoulder, you know, because she doesn't care. But the horrible rejections have, are usually from, you know, sixes or six and a half or fives. Like those are always the, like the real bad ones. Like, why are you talking to me? What's wrong with you? Like all that shit, which barely ever happens depending on what sort of opening <laughs> line you use or, you know, that, that's super rare. But I'm like, no, like start, approach the most beautiful women because, you know, you're only going to, you're only doing yourself a favor by doing that. Yeah, exactly. And wouldn't you rather be rejected by a hot day? Of course, yeah. And, and you know, 99% of the time, it's not you. They right. don't know you. They don't know you from fucking Adam. You know, what are right. you, a mind reader? I tell my clients, can you read minds? <laughs> Do you know <laughs> what's going on in that girl's head? You know? She, she may have just broken up with somebody. Her grandmother may have died. Her dog died. Something, you know, just she wasn't into it at that second. It has nothing, has nothing to, to do with you. Nothing. So, so becoming bulletproof, which is a, a big thing you talk about in your book. Um, yeah. to, to become that, obviously, we need reps. You know, I call them reps, right? You need a lot of repetition with beautiful girls. Right. And, Numbers game. Right. The problem with that is access to beautiful girls can be difficult. Um, you know, sometimes you'll see them walking down the street or dry cleaning or whatever. And obviously you got to take advantage of those situations. But if, typically if you see a, a smoke show out in a social situation, she's going to have like, you know, <laughs> there, there's an army to get through because hot girls don't just roll out to bars alone. And if they're really hot, they're not just going to go with their one girlfriend to a bar because they're getting invited to the Playboy Mansion or they're getting invited to some awesome party with influential people. Right. They they're not you're just not really going to see them out in the social sort of uh, places that you have access to for the normal guy. Would you agree with that or, you know, because you had access, obviously, from 
you know, inside a Playboy, but for a random guy who doesn't have access and he needs to get in reps, what would you say to him or what would you sort mm-hmm. of advise that guy to do? Yeah, it is absolutely true. I had, um, you know, behind the rope access, so to speak, for a long time. And that's how I, I got to learn the dynamic between hot girls and men. Um, but also what happens, and I say this in, in my book, it's basically when you're aware of a particular situation, you see it more. Mm-hmm. So let's say like if you, you want to buy a Corvette, or you buy a Corvette, right? Then you start seeing Corvettes all over the place. Right. It's just some freaky psychological thing. You become aware of what's important to you at the time. So when you become aware of looking consciously looking for beautiful girls, you will find them. You will find them in Starbucks. You'll find them in the supermarket. You will find them in the dry cleaner. You'll find them on the bus. You'll find them on a plane. You'll find them because your, your radar then will be, that's what I'm looking for. And especially if you have one. Of course, yeah. <laughs> if you have one, then you want more of the same. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you a little story too. It's funny you should say that about a group of girls. I was in Valencia, Spain, about a year and a half ago at a, at a men's conference. And I noticed in, in this little plaza, there were five girls there. And four of them, I would say, were nine to 10. And one was not. So just because I know what the approach would, was, I went up to the table and I zeroed in on the not pretty one. And I sat down next to her and I started talking to her. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I really, I don't speak Spanish and I want to get to this museum. Can you tell me? And she started talking to me and she started giggling. And I said, you know, you're really fun. You're, you're, you're you know, you, you'd be a lot fun to hang out with. And she's, oh, I'm so happy. So I noticed now the hotties are looking at each other and they're saying, what the fuck? Why did you yeah. watch her? You know, right. because that's what they think about. Mm-hmm. They're in competition all the time. Crazy competition. Yeah. yeah. So, so competitive. You want to know com- competition? Hot girls are the most competitive creatures ever. <laughs> yeah. So as I walked away, I tapped one of the hot girls on the shoulder and I said, you, could, you should take a lesson from a girl over there and be a lot more friendly. <laughs> you know? And it was just like, what? I know that they started talking about what is, and then they kind of got around the other, the other girl and started asking her questions and stuff. Like, what was he asking you? Why did he talk to you? And then they started talking and it became like a, a whole gaggle of hotties uh-huh. <laughs> clucking at each other. So it, the point of that is y- you could find girls anywhere. I mean, you, you could find hot girls and especially when you're in a situation where you don't think there's an opportunity to meet them, you can make the opportunity. Mm -hmm. yeah that my my kind of intro to um and access to these women was when i started uh i had a bunch of uh, vacation rental properties in new york airbnbs illegal airbnbs basically you know we'd rent places and then sublet them as hotels and uh, i had a buddy who was a club promoter and he needed housing for his models um so we came to an arrangement where I would provide one of my Airbnbs for long-term housing for him. In exchange, I got access to, you know, the clubs and, and his tables, free, free alcohol and the models he would bring out. And I noticed that everything I learned from my, you know, pickup studies did not work at all <laughs> when, when I was in the company of these tables. Because I'd show up to a table, there'd be eight or nine smoke shows, well, my buddy and maybe one other guy and you know of course I was like all right well I'll start talking to the girls and I'll start you know spitting game at the girls and the more I talked to them the more kind of annoyed they became and it's not like I was had horrible conversations because I was you know saying good stuff but the only thing they cared about was status Mm-hmm. They didn't give a shit about my conversation skills. And it's not like it was a great place to have a conversation. It's a loud nightclub, right? Um, so the only way to have a conversation is to talk in each other's ear, at, you know, normal volume. But it wasn't until I basically started ignoring them and not giving a shit and just hanging out with my buddies at the table and, and 
pretending that they basically didn't exist and when they would, you know, <laughs> or totally teasing them, that's when I started having success. But making that transition from like the guy who was constantly approaching women and going out of my way to, you know, to make something happen when I'd see them out in the street or I'd see girls in bars to basically doing nothing and focusing on how do I appear more high status? That was like a total mind fuck for me. So I'm curious in your experience, you know, working for Playboy and all the access you had, did, did you have a similar sort of experience? Did that come more naturally? Um, uh, well, you know, it depended on, on the circumstance. I, I, I'll tell you, Sometimes at the Playboy Club, like at the Playboy Club in Vegas, I used to, to go to uh, quite a bit. And I noticed as not consciously hitting on any of these girls, it's not, it was a nice little gambit that, that mm -hmm. I, I realized, not consciously hitting, but walking around the bar because I was able, I was there to see how the bar was doing and what was happening and the people who were there. So that was kind of part of my job. So I would walk around and I'd be seeing groups of girls and guys and I'd be saying, oh, you having a good time? Everything's cool. Yeah, okay, cool. Okay. And walk away. And I'd right. keep going around the bar. And then I noticed like girls would start coming up to me because they think I own the bar. Right. You know? <laughs> so, like, and, and then it was like, then I, I developed that mindset that that works everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, any bar you want to go into you know, you just walk around like you own the place. Yeah. And don't linger on them. Don't start talking to me. How's you doing? How's everything? Having a good time? Yeah, good, great. How are you friends? You know, are you friends? Yeah, having a party? Cool, cool, man. I'll see you later. And just keep circling, 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 circling. Because then they think, wow, who's this guy? Right. Because he must be the highest status here. Exactly. They want the right. alpha guy. They want the guy who owns the room. Which is amazing news for guys who, you know, when I first learned that, I was like, oh, I don't have to be, you know, Adonis. And no. if, if, if I can, you know, transform myself into a guy who's high status, then I'll be able to get the most beautiful women. And, you know, there's a lot of ways to improve your status. There's really not a lot of ways to improve how good looking you are. Obviously, you got you want to be in the best shape you can be and, and you know, well-groomed, well-dressed. But it's not like you can, you know. You could have plastic surgery, I guess, but that's a, <laughs> just yeah. a horrible, horrible yeah. sort of route. Yeah. And, uh, you know, yeah. it's very subjective with women, too. You mm -hmm. know, a, a lot of PUA guys, you know this as well as I do, they, they throw out scripts and, you know, all these things that you got to do. And the guys go, well, it's just not working. It's not working. Because, first of all, every guy is different. Every single guy is different. And girls respond to different things. Yeah. So they, if they don't like something about you, they're not going to respond to anything. Mm -hmm. They first have to like something, but that something does not have to be you being rich and famous and powerful and tall and handsome and gorgeous. It doesn't have to be any of the. They may like your your hands. They like <laughs> maybe like the way you touch them. They may like your eyes. You may like your beard, but there's got to be something and. If there's something that will grab them, then they'll they'll hook on to you, and mm -hmm. then it's about then you're in, you know. Then all the other stuff goes away. Yeah, I hear a lot of my clients saying the same thing. Like, well, all, the only guys who get these smoke show tens, nines, and tens supermodels are rich and famous, and or just rich. Well, does it help? Yeah, <laughs> it does help, but it's not necessarily. They're not out of your league, as I say in the book. Not right. all of them are out of your league. Totally. I There's think so many beautiful girls. Oh, yeah. The, I, and I think the reason why we come to a lot of these um, off-base conclusions is when we're, whatever, 17, 18, 19, um, it, you know, when I was in middle school and high school, the, the beautiful girls dated typically the beautiful guys because there was no status or money at that age, right? But then... <laughs> As, as women get a little bit older or as the environment changes, right, you get out of high school, then you realize that it's not about the looks, right? It is completely about the, <laughs> the everything else. You know, what you have to, basically what you're saying is, you know, you have to get your foot in the door with something mm -hmm. and then you can play into the rest of your strengths. Um, you, you 
have an interesting bit in the book where you talk about the similarities and some differences between, you know, models and sex workers. I think that would be interesting uh, oh, yeah. to cover <clears throat> a bit. So what, yeah, what, what would you find kind of being in Vivid and then going to Playboy and just in uh, your experience? Well, I'll give you a firsthand experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this, one, this is one of my failures. <laughs> Big time, uh, epic <laughs> failure. Um, I was at a thing and it was this model who was really was gorgeous, six feet tall, raven black hair, beautiful body, everything, man, just ridiculous. And um, we we're at this conference together and, and the second night, I hooked up with her and she lived in another state and it became like, a, it became a text relationship, right? So mm -hmm. initially it was, you know, I played it really smart in the beginning. It was, um, we would text back and forth and they said, well, I'm going to another conference in Vegas. You know, I'd like you to come with me. And she said, no, no, okay, uh, I'll get back to you. Right there, that's a red flag, okay? Red flag, nobody, you're not getting back to me if you can't decide, goodbye. Right. Well, I did. <laughs> okay. okay. Even though I knew better, you know, I did. So she then, um, she blows me off. And then I don't hear from her for months. And then out of the blue, it's, oh, how you do? I've been thinking about you. And we started up the whole thing again. And then it progressed. And I kind of was being very cool at the time and saying, well, look, you know, if you don't want a relationship, you don't want to hang out, then. I... And then she's going to say things like, well, that's not very productive. And the long story short, I find out she not only has a sugar daddy, but she's grooming me to be a backup sugar daddy. Okay. <laughs> okay. And you know, she's telling me she gets eight grand a month from this guy. He bought her a Porsche. He set her up in her own business. She was like saying, well, and I'd say, you know, well, that's pretty cold, man. That's, that's just like a financial arrangement. She goes, all, all relationships are financial. So then the, the light bulb, bulbs went off like, oh, man, you know, they, these girls are in that business for one reason, to make money. Right. Okay. Porn stars. It, there's an in, interesting inverse about porn stars. Porn stars or girls who want to get into porn want to be stars. They need that attention so badly. And you would say, well, why? You know, you can watch some really rough porn now. Why would they be doing the shit that they're doing? You know, they're pretty girls. You know, why? Because they get this power over men. So in one hand, they're stars and they have the power to make men come. Mm -hmm. and that's a turn on for them. They don't really care about the guy. It's just the idea that they have this power. Right. That I can make this guy do what I want. I can make him come. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, so this is the attraction of, of porn girls. You know, they want to be stars in their own right and be idolized. And, and they, they're competing with the other girls who can be dirtier, who can be more popular. And then they, they're making money and they're getting power over men. So that's a, a heady combination right there. Right. Porn. But buyer beware because man, they, the, the only relationships I saw with these girls are usually down and out guys, roadies and bands, ex rock stars, because they got this fantasy that, you know, they're going to hook up with some, romantic rock guy or something right and that usually goes bad because they get drugged out but and it's not that i dislike you know adult workers i don't there's some great great people in there but the girls for by and large you got to be careful with. and this goes for strippers you know it goes for escorts there's Their a job. huge correlation between like sexual abuse um and those sort of you know lack of a father um Absolutely. right and um yeah those girls are hot and they're certainly a lot of fun to fuck but as guy as a guy you get you know we fall in love at first sight you know and you know i've dated a few you know girls in that industry and all of those relationships <laughs> did not end very well right. um you know is uh eventually so, yeah, I mean, yeah. mm -hmm. 
Yeah. It, uh, I had a streak when once I started getting access and, and started scoring more with the, you know, the women of extreme beauty, um, my, <laughs> my relationships took a turn for the worst, which is what I found. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then I learned the, you know, some of these lessons the hard way. Um, did, did you have a, a similar experience or? Um, yeah, that one I just told you about that one. That right. One fast because um once we started um once we started talking some more and then i think i sent her something on valentine's day once and you know i, I re regressed into my rom-com mm -hmm. mentality which was fucking stupid because you know honestly i really liked her you know yeah. I really thought there would be something cool about her she's smart um but she was a high price hooker in a way mm -hmm. uh, and one valentine's day i sent her something text or something and it was kind of romantic and she didn't answer me yeah and so i waited till the next day and i said i texted her back i said wow man not even a response from that you know because at this point i thought we had something going on and she goes well am i supposed to answer you on demand i said what <laughs> <laughs> you see robbie then the new york boy came out in me and i said what <laughs> i said she goes well uh, you know, I'm, she said, I'm tired of this. I'm done. And I said, you're done. I said, well, you're a loss. Yeah. You know, I kind of took that. Out. Then I said, don't think you're fooling anybody. I said, I know what your deal is. You know, you just string guys on until you get what you want. And then she just blocked me forever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's how quick that went down. Yeah. It went from, you know, six month relationship sort of to nothing within a second. Because right. once I called her on it, on her game, all bets were off. Mm -hmm. And that was really enlightening as to these girls, you know, you're right. They either have daddy issues or they've been abused or there's something going on in their heads that's just not allowing them to have relationships. Now, a lot of them are afraid to get too close to somebody. Yeah, you see a lot of avoidant sort of personality uh, traits with the, with the sex workers and strippers or you know and and i think kind of these days with the uh with the emergence of only fans there's a lot more girls getting into that oh yeah oh yeah They're just everyday girls are getting into it mm -hmm. i have a friend who in arizona and uh, i was at his house and his, his daughter is in college and i started getting into this conversation about sugar daddies and she goes oh yeah a lot of my friends have sugar daddies said, oh what? yeah like Seeking arrangements, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, when that site came out, like I was coaching guys on how to be splendid daddies, which is basically, you know, broke sugar daddies, <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> which was, uh, you know, um, ridiculous, but every girl's like, there's, and there was, it was interesting because there's like normal, normal girls jumping on seeking arrangements, just kind of looking for like, well, I should, why can't I have a sugar daddy? Like, all right. So it's, it's kind of becoming this weird hybrid sort of situation. Um, okay. Yeah. And, that, and yeah. also in Eastern Europe, as you know, you know, there's, there's an arrangement where, you know, girls get paid to go on dates. Yep. <laughs> you know, they get percentage of the bill. <laughs> what the fuck is that? <laughs> All of Kiev is basically like one big sugar daddy, sugar baby. Yeah. Fish bowl. <laughs> I mean, there's, of course, there's, there's outliers who don't have that, but it's like the adult Disneyland where kind of all that stuff is the norm and that all, all that stuff goes. But you see, you know, when I go, when I'm back in the US, you see that happen more and more in New York and, and it's kind of becoming the new normal um, just with the, you know, the, the attention currency that's happening with beautiful girls and Instagram, you know, seeking arrangements, Tinder, all that shit. Um, so That's it's a uh, big game changer. You know, yeah. Like before it was much more difficult for a hot girl to, to capitalize on her looks, right. For her to make money, she had to be like the top, top Victoria's secret model. Like even though some of those girls didn't make a lot of money, like if you weren't the, the biggest, hottest, you know, runway model or, you know, famous actress, you didn't make any money if you were a hot girl, but now you just set up an only fans account and you're making you know, five, 10, 15 K a month. Yeah. By, you know, <laughs> so. It was insane. Yeah. yeah. I know it. Um, you know, I, you know, Hefner is, 
as cool a guy as he was, if, if he didn't have his stature, <laughs> he wouldn't have the, the girls that he had because mm -hmm. he's a romantic, basically. Right. Well, whenever we'd be in a meeting, um, you know, there'd be like 10 guys and one woman in there. He would just ignore the guys. <laughs> his focus was completely on women, completely. That, that was his deal. And How accurate was, like, was the, um, the documentary? I watched it was like the 10, the 10 uh, episode mini series. Oh yeah, that was, that was pretty, pretty much on. Mm -hmm. yeah, that was pretty close. I mean. Did you spend much time with him? Um, not a lot, you know, a few meetings, a couple of passes and, and parties and things like that. Um, more with, with the girls, some of his, um, his girls, you know, at the mansion. Uh, Holly was kind of um, the mansion girl. She would, she would take care of what was going on at the mansion, mm -hmm. which was always a hoop. I mean, he had a zoo on the mansion, on the grounds. <laughs> yeah, I played the golf course behind it, and oh, yeah. uh, you can see the monkeys yeah, yeah. <laughs> from, from the tee box back there. Yeah. yeah, L.A. Country Club. Yeah, that's right. That's in Homebay Hills. Yeah. Yeah, it's a cool place. I miss L.A. I, I liked L.A. a lot. Where, oh, you're in New York now, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so were there any, so the becoming bulletproof was, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's obviously where you, you need to get to. Um, it, would you, do you have any advice, um, you know, for the guy who, you know, he, he kind of feel, and I, I see this all the time with guys I'm working with or, you know, guys who hit me up on Instagram, or listen to the podcast and they're all and the typical thing I hear is I want to start dating the higher quality girls, which means the hotter girls typically. Um, so if a guy is, is kind of in that conversation where the quality is not as high as he would like, um, do you have any specific tips, um, in general for, for that guy? Yeah. Um, always keep this in mind. Um, you look at the girl and say to yourself, somebody's sick of fucking her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so true. My, my, my dad told me that. Yeah. <laughs> And it's an old saw, but it really is true. It's so because true. Because if you, you know, you're being totally hypnotized by a girl's beauty. Again, you have to inure yourself from their beauty. Ignore the beauty at all costs because the beauty will absolutely wane as, the, as time goes on. You'll get tired of fucking her no matter how crazy sick freak she is in bed. You will get tired of fucking her. So inure yourself from the beauty. Just ignore it. You know, just like it, appreciate it, but look at it like, well, this isn't going to be all the time. This yeah. is not a constant. This is just, you know, David Ogilvy was a great ad man and his whole thing was in advertising. You know, you have to put ticket on the meat which means mm -hmm. the ticket that is on a piece of meat is going to tell you everything. <laughs> okay? So yeah. that beauty is going to tell you everything. It's going to tell you she could be shallow. She could be a bitch. She could be beautiful. She could be nice. She could be anything. But once you take that ticket off, once you remove the beauty, that's what you're dealing with. So mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're in for just a hot girl to fuck, all right, you take your shot. You know, you, you be as genuine as you could be, your, your authentic self, you know, don't try to play up a, a particular, um, somebody that you admire, don't try to mimic somebody, don't, don't recite canned scripts, that shit doesn't work. Yeah. You, know, you just have to blur out what you're thinking when you see the girl, whatever it is, you know, I like your lips, you know, you walk really cool, you know, even sometimes it sounds even fucking stupid. Like, well, when's the last time you came here? Oh man, that's the worst line I've ever heard. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'll, I'll leave you now. <laughs> Just those are the kinds of things man. that that reality, you know, they, they want to feel like you're comfortable in your own skin. Mm -hmm. I know that's a hackneyed overplayed kind of advice, but it really is so true. And the only way you get there is to be rejected, 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 rejected. Yeah, it's, it's so normal. true. You read the the biographies or you listen to some of these interviews of all the biggest playboys out there. Dan Blazarian, um, 
you know, you, if you listen to his interview with Larry King, he talks about how he approached basically every girl in university and got rejected a gazillion times, you know, and uh, you just, you can't, you have to go through that, that period um, and learn from those rejections and become comfortable with it and not give a fuck until, you know, you're comfortable around beautiful women. That's right. You know, I tell clients, what is a 110 pound girl going to do to you? Right. Yeah. What is she really going to do? You, you walk up to some big football dude in the bar and say, you're fucking ugly. You're going to get your teeth broke. Right. Right. But some cute little girl, what is she really going to do? To you? What, what she's going to do to you is attached to you and your need for validation. You know, you don't feel like you're worthy enough. So by getting hard, then you're going to feel worthy. And that is so wrong. Right. You know, so, she doesn't know you. She doesn't know anything about you. You've accomplished so many things in your life. Just make a list someday. I said, that I've done this, I've done that, I've earned this, I've made that. You know, I've been with this girl, do it there. And then build your build your self-esteem to that point. And I know it sounds real simple. We're not so simple. And guys, you know, I've had guys who are socially crippled. You know, they, they couldn't work, walk up to a beautiful girl what i tell them to do is start start slow go outside you know ask somebody for a dollar straight right. ask them for a dollar you know um some of my training was you know in the middle of Times square you go up to a hundred people in, mm -hmm. uh, at night and ask them something and by the you know the 50th person you don't give a fuck right <laughs> yeah you're getting desensitized to that exactly. uh, i call it a uh, social freedom or, you know, it's, it's, it's basically CBT or cognitive behavioral right. therapy, as they I call it. Uh, yeah, you're just getting desensitized to giving a shit. And uh, there's no way to feel like that unless you, you put yourself in those situations and you do it. That's right. Yeah. You know, we're slaves to that hypnosis because of all of our hormones. There's a whole cocktail full of hormones that start kicking in, especially when we're really horny. And... Um, we, we, you know, being aware of that, cognizant of those things, sets your subconscious up to be able to deal with it. You know, to, when you're constantly aware and step outside of yourself and look at what you're doing, then your subconscious gets to, to the point where it's saying, oh, okay, now I know, now I know. Because, you know, your frontal cortex is fooled. It actually gets fooled. And the frontal cortex in the brain is what makes you do stuff. You know, but it gets fooled by all these hormones racing and, the, and you ignore the red flags. And, you know, as we all have, and any guy who tells you he's been a natural since he's seven years old, well, uh, <laughs> God bless him. Hey, God bless him. <laughs> <laughs> Salute to that guy. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us where can guys, um, you know, grab your book or where can they learn about your trainings and all of this wisdom? Because like I said, there's no better um you know stuff out there and i've seen everything out there when it comes to understanding the psychology uh of beautiful women and, and you know a lot of guys come to me and they're like i want to date a stripper or i want to fuck a porn star and i'm like good like do that get it out of your system hopefully M maybe don't marry her <laughs> but uh, you know if that's on your bucket list like more power to you like like i i'm so glad i did all those things and now i don't need to anymore and i don't give a fuck so <laughs> Exactly. You know? And the don't giving a fuck is, is the key that will get you really where you want to be. And, and you probably are right now because mm -hmm. you have a pretty good life, Rob. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, you know, my book for now is free. It's going to be for a limited time. So you want to grab it, grab it. It's at my website, which is men again, but it's men hyphen again. So it's men hyphen again dot com. Or you can shoot me an email at info at coachbobjohnson.com, info at coachbobjohnson.com. And I'll, I'll shoot you uh, the book. And, you know, I do coach um, all areas, but I'm kind of specializing in this, this hot girl thing right now. I'm kind of, you know, hot girl mind reading 101. You know, the book is a primer. So it gives you the basics and some insight. But in every aspect, there's there's more to drill down to. And, you know, once a guy gets involved with a girl, as you know, Robbie, it's, it becomes a whole nother story. Totally. So. Yeah. 
you can know the stuff psychologically or intellectually, but once you get involved and you've got to be able to make decisions on the fly when you're with her, you know, that's when that <laughs> the rubber meets the road. Yeah. Uh, knowing it and being able to apply it is a vastly different thing. Yeah. And I just wanted to say, you know, I've, I've been involved in a number of coaching programs and Robbie yours is one of the best, if not the best. So thanks. Cool for to you to, you know, to, yeah. Well, Bob, it's been awesome. Thanks so much for coming on. My and pleasure. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, guys get that book while it's free. Uh, you're <laughs> doing yourself a huge disservice to, to not right. if you think you know this stuff, read it. Because I and it does an amazing job of tying together a lot of the different influences from the manosphere, feminism, um, polarity between masculine and feminine, it's cool stuff from the rational male and Rolo's work. So yeah, yeah. 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 Some of the masters, huh? <laughs> Right. Thanks, Bob. All right, brother. Thank you so much. You gotta appreciate it. You be well. Yeah. Thanks for listening. If you want more, go to innerconfidence.com and don't forget to subscribe to this podcast for the latest episodes.